Well, hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bacor, your host, and this is just a quick uh, in-studio episode. I haven't done one of those for quite some time. Uh, I find that most of my viewers prefer the car reviews and the event coverage that I do, so tend to not do a lot of news stories, but it's about the midpoint of the year, and I thought, let's just do a quick recap of what's going on from the world of plug-in sales globally, and let's talk quickly about that. So welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Quick news episode. Let me get right into it. All right, so we're past the halfway mark in the year and time for a look at how, as I mentioned, plug-in sales are doing. So globally, as of July 1st, just over 5.8 million plug-ins were sold globally, uh, about 5,831,864 5, if you want the exact number. And that represents about 15% of the total light duty vehicle market volume. And when, when you hear LDV or light duty vehicle, what that means is that means all passenger vehicles. So sedans, hatchbacks, SUVs, minivans, all that kind of stuff. Everything that can, that us consumers use on a daily basis is what's involved in that. It's not a commercial number. So trucks and, and commercial vehicles, it's really consumer market. So uh, almost 6 million now plugins were sold at the first half of the year, which is a pretty decent pace. Um, and it's up by about 40% year over year for the pace that we're at versus 2022, which is good. Now, what that means is that right now we seem to be at about one in five new passenger cars are a plug-in EV. And when I say plug-in folks, again, that's really all I worry about in track is anything that has a plug. Plug-in hybrid electric vehicle or a full battery electric. I'm not really plug uh, tracking fuel cell vehicles yet because there's such a small percentage of consumer vehicles uh, that it's not even worth tracking at this point. So if they become predominant in the next few years, then we'll have a look at those. But one in five are now a plug-in EV, which is great. I don't track hybrid electric vehicles or HEVs, vehicles that don't have a plug. There's a lot, ton of them. But I find that, you know, they're not, uh, I think we're past that technology and I'm not going to stand on the soapbox to get into HEVs, how I feel about those. But I think we're way past HEVs and folks need to be looking at something with a plug. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. If you're not ready for an all electric, then look for a good plug-in hybrid. You're doing yourself a disservice by not doing that. Of course, out of those numbers, 75%, almost 75% are all electrics. So what does that tell you folks? Does that mean that people are scared of range anxiety, that people are worried about lack of charging infrastructure, that people are really worried about a cost and how, you know, I, I hear oh, all electrics are for the rich. Well, 75% of all plugins that are sold around the world are full electrics. So they're the ones that are selling, not plug-in hybrids when you look at the plug-in market. So obviously they work for the majority of people. And I keep saying that till I'm blue in the face. So if you if, if that's not sinking into you, then you need to do your homework more. And again, I know that all electrics don't work for everyone everywhere, but they can work for most people most of the time. And that's what you need to look at. Now, what the best one, one to highlight to the first half of this year is that Tesla Model Y became the best-selling passenger car model globally, not just all electric, but passenger car in general. Of all passenger cars, including ICE vehicles, the Model Y became the best-selling one globally. That says something, that there is a shift happening. So now the current forecast for 2023 sales predict around 14.3 to 14.5 million. And I started the year, I'd have to go back and look at my January 1 uh, or New Year's episode. And I would encourage you to go back and look at that. I think I predicted around 14 million, 12 to 14 million. So I might be a little low on that. Um, but I'm not too far off and which would represent decent growth. But again, we're not seeing this doubling or, or incremental tripling effect that some people are calling for. It's not happening that fast, but 14.3, 14.5 million EVs for this year, which would be a growth of about 36% over 2022. Not bad because we did almost 11 million in 2022. So definitely some growth there. If we look at the North American market, because that's a market that's, uh, that's really needs to catch up to a lot of the other parts of the world, like China and Europe. If we look at the USA for the first half of 2023, there were just uh, over 780,000 um, plug-in uh, electric vehicles that were sold in uh, the first half of this year in the U.S. Um, uh, and out of these 556,707 were all electric. So again, 70 plus percent of these uh, vehicles that are even being purchased in the U.S. for plug-in vehicles today 
are all electric. So people are seeing the value and having confidence in these vehicles. So for those that spread the FUD that they're no good and they don't work, the numbers are not backing you up. So if you're going to go out there and spread information like this, you need to have the facts to back you up. And if you don't have the facts, then shut your trap. That's all I have to say about that. So the forecasted that the U.S. is expected to hit 1 million all electrics alone this year, and they're well on track for that. So they should surpass the 1 million electrics. Certainly states like California, Oregon, Washington, a lot of the other ZEV states are the ones that are driving these mandates, but they are filtering to a lot of other states. And of course, the Biden's RRA is fueling that again now, starting to see more sales because of that. The infrastructure that's being, uh, money that's being paid for infrastructure, all this stuff. So it's all good stuff. Now, just to put those numbers in context, uh, currently there's just over 4 million plugins that are on the road in the U.S. or that have been sold in the U.S. since 2010. So we're seeing some exponential growth now, obviously, uh, in the last decade uh, that's passed. Uh, we're going to probably double this number within the next couple of years at the pace that uh, the U.S. is at. So that's good. If I look at Canada, we don't yet have Q2 numbers for Canada plug-in sales yet. I don't know why stats can, and the numbers are really slow coming out. But for Q1, we had just over 30,000, almost 31,000 plug-in vehicles sold nationally in Canada. 23,000 and change were all electrics, of course, and just uh, and about 6.7K were plug-in hybrids. So again, a vast majority of Canadians in 70 plus percentile, 75 percentile are buying all electrics, even for our cold climate country, our vast distances that we have here in Canada, we have a population of under 40 million and we have a geography that's huge. Uh, people are still buying all electrics. So they are the more popular vehicle. So even if we extrapolate those numbers um, and we look at 60,000 for Canada for the first half, that would put us at about 120,000. Well, for all of 2022, we had just over 123,000 new plug-in sales. So we're about 50% of last year. We're tracking at uh, very basically flat growth. I think we'll see if this picks up. I think we'll, we, it will pick up in the second half of this year because last year we saw 8% growth, but we may see maybe 2 to 3% this year because factors that are impacting sales uh, of, of plugins, of course, are inflation. I mean, here in North America, we're suffering high inflation numbers. We've got the economy that people are worried about. Pricing is still relatively high. We haven't hit cost parity. Vehicle availability uh, is, is still a challenge, you know, try to get an Ionic 5 right now from Hyundai, great vehicle, but you might have to wait a year or two. Uh, so we're still seeing the, some bottlenecks there and, and a lot of the big OEMs haven't ramped up yet. And there's still those consumer fears about lack of charging infrastructure, which again, I say in general, they shouldn't be feared. There's a very good base infrastructure already in place. And again, you'd have to look at your own personal needs and where you are regionally, because there are dark zones, I get it, but it's a case by case basis. But for the 80% of the urban, of the population of both the US and Canada, has decent infrastructure. I will tell you that right now, enough that you can travel. So uh, stay away from the FUD and get your facts straight. So to summarize, the global growth is proceeding at a nice pace. Uh, I'd like to see it even better. And, uh, and you know, why I do what I do, again, is to try to push and, and expedite people's decisions into getting into an all-electric or a plug-in hybrid, a good plug-in hybrid, but a plug-in vehicle sooner than they may have. It's we're, not, we're at a point now where you can't say, well, I'm going to wait for the next vehicle. I'm going to wait till 2030, till, I'm going to wait till all this stuff. We folks who really don't have the time to wait that long. You're seeing all this stuff with climate change, the, the the massive fires in Maui now. We just have so much stuff we can't even keep up with what's going on. Noah's predicting a very heavy uh, hurricane season this fall coming up. Uh, that's going to be uh, you know maybe unprecedented. So these things are happening, and it's just going to continue to get worse if we don't decide to change. And consumer vehicles make up about 20% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a significant number. It's not enough to reverse it or to get it to net zero, but it's enough to make a difference. And that difference could extend the time that we have to combat global uh, climate change. And that's the point I'm trying to make with all this folks is you need to look at that. So if you have one, you know, two or three or four cars in your household, change one of them to an all electric. 
you'll get financial benefits, you'll learn about charging, you'll be comfortable with it, and you still have your gas car if you want to do those long trips, which people are, are you know, claim that's exactly why they need a nice car, because they go twice a year to the cottage or whatever. Great, then rent a car or keep a nice car, but start looking at it now. There's a ton of models. There's a ton of different price points. There's a lot of different vehicles. There's lots of incentives now all around the world. We still have a lot of national incentives going on and, and for local incentives. So it makes sense to get into a, a good plug-in vehicle now, not wait another year or so. And if you're looking at a vehicle that's that's got a year wait list, don't wait a year before you put your name on it put your name on it, get a reservation in now. And also we need the OEMs to start cranking it up. You know, I've been following GM since 2016, since Trev and I started doing the Model 3 podcast uh, or the show. And I've been plugging in, you know, other manufacturers since day one. And GM has been one of them. They need to really get off the pot now and start cranking up production because all these announcements, and I'm going to talk about GM in a sec, are great, but they need to start putting product out there for consumers to drive. Um, they really need to get the numbers up. So I'm confident that in Stellantis and all the other, Ford needs to crank it up even more. All the big guys need to jump in now with both feet and get going on this. Otherwise, I don't know, the future is going to be looking pretty grim, folks. So uh, that's the way it is. So that's where we are from a global perspective. Hopefully that was some helpful. Now, Let's switch gears and just talk about a couple of quick announcements that happened over the last couple of weeks. A GM, I'm going to focus on GM. They came out and then revealed the 2025 Cadillac Escalade IQ. And that's their next Altium-based all-electric offering in the Cadillac, uh, of course, uh, Escalade IQ. Uh, one thing I want to point out is this is not an existing Escalade electrified. It's not taking their existing platform and just putting in electric motors and a battery pack and wiring and stuff and removing the internal combustion vehicle, uh, the internal combustion engine components. It's not that. This is a ground up platform based on Altium, and which means it's going to get a lot of benefits uh, being a ground up platform for the electrified landscape. So they've done a good job there by what we've seen so far. Now, this uh, all new battery electric vehicle will offer an estimated 450 miles or 724 kilometers of range that's massive with power coming from a 200 plus kilowatt hour battery pack in fact the details on the pack are not out yet but it's estimated that i've been reading for some people are predicting that it's around 205 or so kilowatt hours so we'll have to wait and see but it's definitely a similar size pack that you would find in the hummer ev and that makes sense this is a big vehicle it's heavy you're going to carry seven passengers and stuff you need a big battery to get you long range so that makes perfect sense that it should be very similar double stacked Altium. Don't know if it's going to be LG cells or whoever sells a pouch or cylindrical. I don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's going to be a big pack that offers great range. And also it's based on that 800 volt architecture, which means that it will support fast, ultra fast charging speeds of up to 350 kilowatts. Now I don't, there's no curve out yet because it's, it's not even out yet, but I suspect that it will pull a decent amount of uh, initial pulls somewhere in the high 100s into the 200 kilowatt, if not even a little bit more than that. Um, but uh, it does support fast charging and GM claims that adding 100 miles or 160 kilometers can be achieved in 10 minutes of DC fast charging at a 350 kilowatt hour, or at a 350 kilowatt charger. And I would s extrapolate from that about 10 to 80 percent road trip charging times in about 30 to 40 minutes, which is about the norm. 30 minutes is kind of the new norm now. So if it's a little bit more because of that big ass battery, uh, it's going to be it's going to be fine because you're going to be able to drive. You know, in essence three three to four hours right of highway driving and then stop for 30 minutes that's not bad at all folks um i think that that's very very doable and then the savings you get from that now the escalate iq will be offered as an all-wheel drive uh version only with two motors it gives power output of up to 750 horsepower and 785 pound feet of torque and of course you need all that power to move that mass around all the people and stuff it should propel the full-size SUV from 0 to 60 in less than 5 seconds. I'm saying probably 4.8 four or something like that. And, it sh and uh, GM claims, uh, Cadillac claims it'll be able to tow up to 8,000 pounds. Of course, your range is going to plummet if you're towing 8,000 pounds, but you'll be able to do it. It does have a big trunk, 
Uh, I don't know the, the, the boot space yet. It has a sizable frunk as well. It's a 12 cubic feet, just over 12 uh, cubic feet of, of a frunk space, which is pretty usable. And uh, that means you can store stuff for up to seven passengers because it has it's a three row configurated vehicle and you can do executive seating and all this kind of stuff as you're seeing by the pictures and video. Now, Cadillac has also incorporated the rear wheel steering system from the Hummer and Silverado EVs, which enables the Escalade IQ to drive diagonally. So, aka the crab walk, not exactly that, but pretty close. You can get into tighter parking spots and you can trim. It brings down the turning radius of this large vehicle to under 40 feet, which is pretty good for a massive three row SUV. So it's in the size of this uh, of the Cadillac IQ Escalade IQ sits between the current regular and the long wheelbase versions of the gas powered Escalade. So if you're familiar with those models, you'll get a sense of size from this. It sits between those two. As you can see by the video and picture, styling is very Cadillac, right? I love the styling. I love the lyric. You guys know I'm really stoked on the lyrics. So they've they've taken some features from there. The lyric is their base bar, right? It's their new design language as they move forward in the Cadillac realm, um, which again, a lot of styling cues based from the lyric so that you're going to see the continuation of that design language. Similar, the uh, Escalade IQ keeps that. It's its own, but it does have its own distinct design and I like it. I'm not a big SUV person, never have been, but I think this thing looks sharp. Lots of tech inside, including a full width 55 inch bank of screens. That's huge. <laughs> Man, these screens get bigger and bigger. Pretty soon we won't even have a front windshield. It'll all be digital cockpit. What the heck's going on here? Uh, just like virtual reality for, you know, so you've got big screens for digital instrumentation cluster and the center touch screen, as well as a passenger screen. And in fact, um, and there's also a fourth screen, uh, technically, which is an 11 inch screen, which is for the center console for your HVAC and all this other stuff. So you've got you want screens and you can see by some of the video that you can put screens in the back seats and you can put screens everywhere it looks like on this thing so if you want to be surrounded by uh, technology you can be if you want more information check out cadillac's website and see the details now pricing this thing's not going to be cheap right i'm not aware of what escalates cost today i know that uh fairly well equipped ones can get up in the six figure this is no less this is going to start at about 130,000 us price points so probably 149.9 or 150 Canadian, something like that. Uh, and GM Cadillac forecasts that this is going to enter production in the summer of next year. So about a year from now, they'll be built at GM's factory zero plant in Michigan as a 2025 model year offering. So good, good to see. Now, one key point I want to bring up on this Escalade, I know it's a big vehicle and we were getting sick of these giant SUVs, but it is a very substantial vehicle for Cadillac. It's one of their best-selling products, if not their best-selling product, one of the best-selling product. And in that full-size SUV marketplace, they're in the top three with this product. In fact, they may even be leading in a lot of different uh, cases. So it's a very important product for Cadillac. Just like the Ford F-150 and the Ford Mustang is so critical to Ford, this is a signature uh, product for Cadillac. And for them to fully electrify it, again, it shows their commitment in moving forward to that all-electric future. So good on GM. Now, staying with them, they also, of course, announced that the Bolt EV will live on. Yay! as a new addition uh, based on the Altium platform. Now the current Bolt uh, was is ceased to pr end production by the end of this year. So if you're looking to buy one, this is the time, the next six months is the time to get one while you can because they're great products, even the current, the current offering today. Great price points, good value. Um, but they will stop production of those by the end of this year. And it, this makes sense. You know, if you look at, again, GM's direction of Altium and trying to get to those economies of scale, it just makes perfect sense that they implement Altium into the Bolt platform. And that's what we're going to see coming in the future. Now, there's no no dates or timeframes on this yet, but it makes perfect sense. You know, again, as GM's looking to standardize on Altium, it's a good business plan for them, right? They really need to get to these economies of scale. GM, as an example, really needs to crank up the economies of scale to be able to become profitable at these sub 40K, sub 30K price points, which is where we need to get to, right? We can't be trying to push $130,000 SUVs everywhere we really need to get this down and they've they've come out with the equinox right the equinox ev at thirty thousand starting msa rp so they're trying to get there they just need to get these economies of scale going like 
you know, uh, Elon had to do with the Model 3 in order to start making some money on these. So it's good business sense for them to, to shift over to Altium, the Bolt, and to bring it up to date with current battery technologies, right? Because they need to do that. Now, not much information has been provided, anything other than what I'm saying here. But again, I'm very happy that GM's continuing on with the, with the Bolt because it's been a great product for them. Even though they haven't built a lot, uh, everybody that I talk to that has a Bolt absolutely loves it, even though they went through this LG battery recall issue and they're still going through that. People that have had a Bolt that got the new battery are loving it even more. So it's been a great product and, and you know people bash GM and the Bolt, but you talk to owners and I would say well over 95% of them have decided to keep their bolts and not trade them in, get the batteries fixed, and are, are basically driving new vehicles again. So what a deal they got. So absolutely phenomenal. And remember, that recall was based on, what, uh, 7 or 10 fires out of 140,000 units? Such a small percentage. You know, it was, it was in GM's best interest to, to to get it looked at obviously but they didn't really even have to for those low numbers so good on them for doing that and i know the newer ev and euv models have been selling well you can find some but they've been doing well despite low production volumes so again you know to summarize on gm you know they they keep saying they're committed to an all-electric future we know that that's the way they're going they need to get the economies of scale to bring more affordability affordability to the all-electric offering, EV offerings. And I think the Bolt is a great place to start or to, to, for them to really accomplish this. I mentioned that the, the new uh, Equinox EV um, <clears throat> has been stated at an MSRP of 30000 US or $35,000 Canadian as a starting price. That's great. Well, we still need to get cheaper, right? I talk to people saying I need twenty-five thousand dollar vehicle. I need to in the you know in the low twenties. We're not even close there yet. Even even with some incentives in the U.S., you can get into the nineteen k range with with the Fed tax credit stuff. So it is plausible with some of these vehicles, but it's not the norm, and we need to get the norm. So I think I'm just going up and going to predict here. I think that the Bolt will come in closer. Once I can get this thing going to $25,000 US or maybe $29,995 Canadian, under, just under 30 k And I think that's where true affordability starts, right? We factor in a little bit of incentives and then your total cost of ownership and stuff, it just brings it down. It's such an easy argument to make. It's not even an argument at this point, folks. The facts show for themselves, but makes it much easier for people to understand. So GM can do this. And of course, make a profit on the new bolts, right? It may, it may not make enough as much as they make it on Escalade or a Lyric or something, but they're, they've got to be able to make something. Then that can certainly, in my opinion, change drastically the momentum of the EV market space, especially here in North America, where we are still lagging and change it for the better. So more information on the new bolt should be coming from GM soon. So stay tuned to your news feeds for more info on this. All right, and that's it for this edition of the EV Revolution Show. Thanks for tuning in. All the information to contact me is coming up. If you have questions, email me. It's, it's, it's coming up. I'd love to get emails from you, not just in the comments, but send me an email if you've got a personal thing. Also, don't forget, I'm going to be appearing at Fully Charged Live Vancouver coming up in, in about a month now, in, in uh, first weekend in September. I'll be out there for three days. i got a booth. I'll be on some panels. If you're coming out, uh, email me uh, or message me if you want a coupon code for a one-day pass or some savings, a discount on, on a pass. Um, send me a message and I'll send you something there if you're going out to Fully Charged Live Vancouver. If you do come out, please come by and see me. I hope to see you there. And everybody stay safe. And until the next time, I'll see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.